Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Keith Hopper. I'm the co-editor of this book, uh, Door Opening, Sligo and the Legacies of Partition. I'll go through the running order for tonight's event uh, in a moment. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background to this project. This book has its roots in a series of writing workshops called Legacies of Partition, which took place in Sligo in 2022 as part of the Decade of Centenaries program, which is coming to a close. And the workshops were led by the journalist and writer Susan McKay, who was then Sligo Library's writer in residence. Um, unfortunately, Susan can't come tonight and she sends her apologies to you all. A door opening includes um, work by some of the people who took part, part in the workshops, as well as commissioned work from a number of established writers who were living in and around Sligo. The title comes from a public interview conducted by Susan with the distinguished writer and broadcaster Fergal King in April 22 here in the library. Um, and an extract from that is included in the book. I think actually it's recorded online still. So, But in a very wide-ranging discussion about the traumatic legacies of war, Fergal spoke very frankly about his own family's involvement in the War of Independence and also about his personal experience as a, a war correspondent. And in the course of uh, the interview, Fergal remarked how enough time had now passed for some harsh truths about the War of Independence and the Civil War to finally be spoken about. And he said, quote, that suddenly is a door opening which wouldn't have been possible when I was growing up, or I suspect for many people here. So um, before I introduce tonight's speakers, all of whom were involved in the workshops on the book, uh, I just want to say it was a real privilege to have been involved in making this anthology. Um, this is actually the 20th book I've edited. Um, it's been one of the most complex and the most rewarding of all of those. Uh, complex, there's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, we have 30 contributions ranging across a variety of forms and genres. We have poems, memoirs, short stories, critical essays, interviews, as well as extracts from a novel, a libretto, and a film script. Um, it's also deeply rewarding for me for a number of reasons. Um, First, I'm proud of the fact that it includes contributions from established and from first-time writers. Um, and given the theme of the anthology, the legacies of partition as seen from Sligo and its border hinterlands, it seemed only right that there's no boundaries, no hierarchy between the different writers uh, or between the different forms. So we've just grouped them together into three thematic sections, unfinished business, haunted places, and unapproved roads and we've allowed the contributions to flow into one another. And I hope the contributors are pleased with that. But thank you to them all for contributing to this rattle bag. Um, secondly, I'm proud of the fact that this is being hosted as part of The Word, uh, which is an ongoing collaboration between the writing and literature program at ATU Sligo and Sligo Central Library. And a number of former and present members of ATU staff are included in this book along with three of our former students, which is especially pleasing. Um, there is a writing culture emerging here that is very strong. So I hope there's many more of these projects in the future. I'm also delighted to welcome Una Parsons here, the head of college at ATU Sligo. And finally, I'm really proud of the fact that this book has been produced through this particular library. Um, when I was a child growing up in Sligo town, my mother, who's here tonight, brought me here when I was about six or seven, and I haunted the place for years after that. Um, this is where I learned how to read. Um, and I doubt I would have gone to university to study writing and literature without this place. So I'm really grateful to the staff of Sligo Central Library, especially Donald, uh, especially Donald Tinney, Michelle Brennan, and Patricia Kane. Uh, Patricia can't be with us tonight, sadly, but the book would not have happened without her energy and commitment. And just to say, I think it's important to acknowledge public libraries are among the last great civic spaces in Ireland. And we should cherish and celebrate them as much as we possibly can. I seem to remember not too long ago, this library was under threat of closure. So we must remember that. Libraries are a space 
for free where we can all read and think. And in the case of this book, it's a space in which we can write and create as a community. So it's very, very important. All of the pieces we have here attempt to give insight into the legacies of partition as seen from the vantage point of Sligo and its hinterlands. And as Fergal Keane said in his interview last year, and I quote, he says, they say that journalism is the first draft of history, but it's not. It is the poetry and songs that come from the people themselves. They will tell you what it felt like. And I hope that the book does justice to that sentiment. So uh, let me just go quickly through the running order for tonight's event. Firstly, I want to call on the Cahirlock of Sligo County Council, Councillor Gerard Milani, to officially launch the book. Then we'll have some readings from three of our uh, distinguished contributors, Marion Dowd, Mary Branley, and Jean Bleakney. After that, we'll have another musical interlude from our wonderful harpist, Ramona. Uh, we'll, we'll then try, I'll keep an eye on time, we're gonna have a, a short panel discussion with our three readers. Uh, and time permitting, we'll open it up to the audience for a quick Q&A, just to get a sense of what people feel 100 years on from partition. Um, and we're gonna conclude the event with some closing remarks from Donald Tinney, the county librarian, and the decade of centenaries coordinator and we'll have a final piece of music from Ramona to wrap it up. So does that sound all right? We'll get through it. So first of all, just if I could call on the care like of Sligo County Council, Councillor Gerard Mullaney to launch the book. Good evening, Councillor Bree, Castle Clerk, Gibbons and Walsh, CE Martin Leiden and Staff, as Sligo County Council Decade of Centenary program draws to a close, the support of the Department of Tourism, Culture, Air, Skate, Sport and Media in the delivery of this program has been central and is gratefully acknowledged. The Decade of Centenary has allowed us to commemorate a complex period in our history. During the past 10 years, the commemoration events workshops and the conferences exploring the Civil War in Sligo has allowed greater understanding and a new prospect to develop. The engagement with local historians, artists, creatives, communities has enabled the creation of a space for discussion and exploration. There has been many highlights throughout the past 10 years, the openness and respect shown by all participants to listen, engage, commemorate has been constant throughout. Sligo County Council wishes to acknowledge the active citizenship that has proven crucial to the success of a varied and inclusive programme. As a closing project in Sligo County Council Decade of Centenary programme, it is fitting to publish this book, A Door Opening, to document the Legacy of Partition workshop. The volume contains submissions from those who attended the workshops along with the published authors. This equality is a fitting representation of the inclusion Sligo County Council endeavours to achieve in the delivery of the Decadent Centenary Programme and indeed in the delivery of all council services. Sligo County Council wishes to congratulate Susan McKay, writer in residence, decadent of Centenary Sligo, on this impressive publication, along with co-author Dr. Keith Hopper of the ATU Sligo. We also wish to thank Donald Tierney, County Librarian, for his coordination of the Decade of Centenary Programme. It's my great pleasure to, just, to uh, declare this book launched. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so we have a few readers uh, now. Uh, our first reader is Dr. Marion Dowd. Marion's um, originally from West Curry, but she's been living in the Northwest for almost two decades. She's an archeologist and a lecturer at ATU Sligo. Marion's published and lectured extensively on Irish cave archeology span and laterally on the intersection between folklore and archeology. span Most recently, her research has been focused on Sligo's civil war. And last year, as many of you will know, she directed 
the archaeological excavations of the cave dugout used by the North Sligo IRA during the revolutionary period and has co-authored a book on Sligo's Noble Six. Um, several contributors actually, including Mary here, refued, re referred to the caves in Glencar in their work. And Marion's writerly focus, though, is on the folklore associated with these terrible events. So, uh, Marion. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Keith said, I'm an archaeologist, uh, and I took part in the workshops over those 10 weeks that Susan coordinated, and they were so incredibly rich. It's wonderful to see so many of, of the people here that were part of that workshop. Uh, it was an incredible kind of three-month experience. We were such a kind of eclectic and diverse group. Everyone came from different types of backgrounds, had different experiences of, you know, family members in the Civil War, War of Independence, uh, and it all gelled. It was just one of those things that worked really well. And I suppose I want to second what Keith said in terms of commending Sligo Library. They're just so fantastic in terms of, you know, um, acknowledging the, the very rich history that we have here in Sligo and creating a space for unusual workshops like this to take place and then supporting the final production. And uh, we're very lucky to have uh, this book in Keith's and Susan's good hands and keen eyes and producing such a wonderful volume. Uh, I'm an archaeologist, I'm not a historian, and that's why I joined the writing group to try and get an insight into the minds of historians and how they work. Um, and I didn't have any history myself in terms of, you know, relatives being involved in the revolutionary period. Uh, but I became very interested in some of the folklore that was documented by the school's folklore collection in the 1930s. And essentially, and I've heard of more of this since uh, I wrote the piece, but basically very traumatic events like uh, the killing of Sligo's Noble Six uh, during the Civil War, the money gold ambush outside Grange where four RIC constables were killed, and then the Chaffpool ambush outside Tower Curry where a young uh, a detective inspector was also killed. Um, all of these very tragic and, and horrific events have often led to folk tales or supernatural events. And I think what we're seeing here is the channeling of that trauma into a ghost story or a story about the fairies. And really, uh, those things are reflecting how terrible um, the community found these atrocities to deal with. Uh, so I'm just going to read from the last piece of my chapter. Um, supernatural phenomena as expressions of collective trauma. So folk tales are often dismissed as little more than humorous or superstitious anecdotes that have little to contribute to academic or scientific research, but this is a naive perspective. Folk tales can be sources of great insight into how communities navigated their present, made sense of their past and created hope for the future. One of the roles of folk tales is to contain and transmit the unspoken and the unspeakable. Experiences and emotions that are taboo or deeply traumatic can often emerge in the form of a folk tale. The supernatural offers a mechanism for explaining the inexplicable and making human sense of acts of great inhumanity. To use the language of psychotherapy, providing supernatural explanations for difficult life events allows individuals and communities to process trauma. Stories can serve as a coping mechanism. The three narratives described here, the Chaffpool ambush, where there was a ghost of, of the young man seen afterwards, um, the money gold ambush where the fairies tormented um, a wife of one of the IRA men captured and then the killing of the noble six where the mountain collapsed, part of the mountain collapsed. So these three traumatic stories that I discuss in the chapter um, provide an insight into the experiences of those who witnessed but were not directly involved in atrocities that occurred in rural parts of County Sligo during the War of Independence and Civil War. 
Events of this nature were surely unprecedented, thereby deeply impacting upon the collective consciousness of the rural communities that were literally left to pick up the pieces. You know, it's the bystanders who are, who are dealing with the corpses. During what was a highly charged and politicized period, the devastation of war was something that families and communities could not openly discuss. It is likely that during the War of Independence, expressions of remorse or sympathy for members of the Crown forces who were killed or seriously injured were perceived as traitorous towards the Republican cause. Uh, to openly empathise with those on the other side, such as the RIC men killed at Moneygold and Chaffpool or their devastated families, would have been inherently dangerous. Yet from a human perspective, civilians who witnessed violent deaths and attacks must have experienced a range of emotions regardless of their political viewpoints. Feelings of revulsion, terror, shock or anger could not be safely expressed, perhaps not even within the family home. Communities and individuals fractured by violence needed an outlet, and some of that trauma could be funneled into folk tales. The supernatural accommodated the super unnatural. The Chaffpool ambush and Money, Money Gold ambush occurred quite early in Sligo's War of Independence, a factor that likely played a role in the subsequent emergence of supernatural phenomena. But as the war progressed, people may have become more emotionally or psychologically equipped to deal with incidences of extreme violence and death. Thank you, Marion. Um, our next reader is Mary Branley. Mary is a poet, writer, and musician based in North Sligo. She's the author of three collections of poetry, most recently, A Pinch of Snow in a Black Velvet Love, published by Lepus Print in 2021. She was awarded the Patrick and Catherine Kavanagh Fellowship in 2008, closely associated with Kids Own Publishing Partnership, a children's publishing house, Mary's facilitated children's writing for over 22 years and 45 titles. Her libretto on the life of Constance, Countess Markovich, Freedom Letters, was first, first performed at the Hawkswell in July of this year. Um, and just to say, Mary wonderfully uh, contributed two pieces to the book. In her extract from Freedom Letters, which is a series of imaginary letters between Countess Markovich and the Ukrainian writer and activist Valeria O'Connor Valinska, Mary gives voice to Constance Markovich, whose concern for the poor is as relevant today as it ever was, and I quote from the poem, and still the people go on trusting kings, capitalists, and clergy who build their fortunes on mass enslavement from womb till death. Mary also contributed a second piece, the legacy of my grandfather, Patrick Branley, which amongst other things recalls her grandparents getting married during the Civil War, although Mary, I think, always thought it was the War of Independence until Marion pointed out the dates. So there's a whole family history emerging here. So, Mary. Thank you very much. And I uh, also would like to say this was my library of childhood as well. Our mother brought us here weekly. Um, I got through the children's section quite quickly and wanted to move on to the adults, but um, there was a bit of a delay on that. Um, so, you know, from Bobby Brewster to Biggles, you know, kind of a jump. It's certainly the artwork by Bernard McDonough, the, 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 uh, the Battle of the Book, is seriously ingrained in, in my mind, and it is quite, it's very evocative to be sitting looking at it. So anyway, thank you very much for including me, um, but also, I'm here uh, to represent my ancestors, uh, who I think are proud of this moment. So I myself hopefully will have a little bit of modesty around it. Um, and I'd like to share with you the poem that is part of my inclusion about Patrick Bradley, my grandfather. So I wrote the poem a long time ago. I was in North Carolina and I was sort of interrogating the past somewhat. Um, I had been here in the summer 1992. I had attended the 8th summer school on a kind of a pirate basis 
if I did some library duties for Maura McTighe in the afternoon. So I was weaving Yeats and some of my past together, including my grandfather, who's actually buried in Drumcliffe Graveyard as well as WB. Uh, though they would have had a very different take on life and probably different politics as well. But the poem, I, I was interrogating my grandfather because my, my father always felt the best man walker never was Michael Collins, and that would have been quite against really some of the rest of the family's ideas. He also was, I think, quite angry that his family were plunged into poverty following the death of his father. He was only four. And the aftermath of all of that was quite um, profound. And I remember the first time hearing that story of my grandfather's death and being absolutely stricken as a small child. But later on, so here I am 30 years later or whatever, saying, well, grandfather, what were you at? Why did you get involved? So I, I you know, as my father would say, call that man to answer. So I did ask my grandfather, would he come and speak to me and tell me why he had gotten involved so heavily and at such a heavy cost to himself and his family. And I'll, I'll say that poem for you at the end. But I was delighted when that poem was taken by my dear friend Leland Bardwell. And uh, she said, Mayor, I'm going to send that to Elaine. Elaine, I love it, you know. So it was published first in Cyphers in 1999. And I was overjoyed. This was not my first publication, but to be published in Cyphers was a great, uh, well, great kudos for me. So I rang my mother and said, I have a big surprise. And uh, I was, you know, I was a visiting teacher for Travellers at the time, so I popped in on my lunch break and proudly opened the book. And my mother got a shock. She went white and she went red and she burst out crying. And she said, I don't know what your father's going to say about that. And I, I couldn't get over it. And I was like, well, I, look, it's only a poem. No one reads poetry anyway, and that book is probably even in Sligo. So um, I said, I better go down and face the music to my father in the garage on the, on the keys. I went in with the book and said, you better sit down there, Dad. I have something to show you. And he sat down, read the poem, burst out crying as well. So I'm terribly confused, very apologetic. And I'm thinking, that's the last time I'm ever showing them any work. So it took a while for them to come around. But probably after a month, my mother rang me and said, your father's looking for that book. He wants to send it to America, to his brothers and his sister, because it was a very powerful moment in the family. So the poem is called Firing Squad. And this is it. Feverish you were and yearning, filled with desire and a restless heart, like mine, like mine, that drove you from Glencar into the struggle, from farming to internment in the British camp, a prisoner of war. And in between you murdered one or two or maybe 10 soldiers of the Crown before they broke your back and let you go. The ambulance stopped in Lugnagall in 1935. My father in his second week of school was summoned to the gates where you stood propped on sticks and leaning. You had already said goodbye to wife and unborn child, the toddler in the puddle outside the house, and now the other five stood facing you, worse than any firing squad, those trembling tears. Your final words are framed between the pillars of the gate. Listen to your teachers. Do what your mother says. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Not a dry eye in the house. Um, our third reader and contributor is Jean Bleakney. Uh, Jean was born in Newry to Fermanagh parents 
1956. Her father was a border customs officer. Um, she lives outside Belfast now. Her most recent publications are Selected Poems from 2016 and No Remedy from 2017. And Jean um, contributed three poems to our anthology, all of which offer snapshots of the troubles from a different cultural and political perspective. So the Sunday after Bloody Sunday remembers a civil rights march in Uri in 1972, but from a Protestant perspective. Concession reflects on the compromises necessary to deliver peace and the human cost involved in that. And Postcard beautifully remembers the disappeared, those tragic victims of the troubles who still have no known resting place. And I quote from the poem, in rain that is commensurate with tears, another generation learns to grieve. So um, please say a warm welcome for Jean Bleakney. Uh, I'm very grateful to Susan and Keith for uh, accepting these three pieces. It was lovely to come down here last year and take part in one of the workshops. And uh, I met Marion there and Mary. It was a lovely day. So the Sunday after Bloody Sunday, um, both Heaney and Longley have written uh, in several poems about their experiences of that day. What happened that Sunday afterwards was a huge march in Newry, which had everybody on tenter hooks. So this is my experience of, of that day. <clears throat> Civil Rights March, Newry, 6th of February, 1972. I stood beside my father at the bedroom window, the same window we had lain underneath the night before internment, listening as the crowd was stirred up and told to bang bin lids at the first sign. We stood, my father and I, beside the fire extinguisher, roll of chicken wire, lathes, hammer and nails, and watched the steady stream of outsiders their beards, sheepskin jackets and duffel coats, their southern accents. We watched as they marched down the hill into Newry, where, as we could see through the other window, thousands had already gathered at the meadow. We tuned in to the police frequency on the radio, heard their anxiety. The town had been sealed off. They're still coming. Where are they getting in? Where? And I said, ring them, Daddy, ring them. Not that he needed me to tell them. It was dealt with. I was 16. I knew this day was taking us to the edge. Newry wasn't Paris, 1968. It wasn't Alabama. I hated their appropriation of we shall overcome. I was afraid. We were being invaded. We were afraid. Good men prevailed. The lines held. Everybody had a day to remember, a day never to be repeated. That was our last year on the hill. A policeman, two doors down, burned out. Another, four doors up, bombed out. I vowed to myself that I'd never forget how women of all ages, could think up and shriek such things to young soldiers about their mothers, their girlfriends. There was worse, much worse to come. Um, this, say, uh, oh, you're okay. I did feel kind of awkward about uh, afterwards after I had submitted these, but Martin Doyle's Dirty Linen is out there and I think just certain of us of a, a generation are just wanting to have our speak and uh, this is what this is, the door opening. This uh, last poem I'll read is called Concession and it's a poem that addresses language. Um, we talked about, somebody mentioned unapproved roads there. Well, there were concession roads, which allowed you to kind of slip in and out. 
But this poem is called Concession. It's also, it's the other meaning of concession. And um, it addresses the, the oft uh, repeated hard border that kind of dominated discourse for years throughout the Brexit thing. It's still there. And it made me think, what, what is a hard border? So, concession. According to Chambers, there are 40 definitions for the adjective hard. Difficult to bear or endure is number 12. It was a hard border for widows whose husbands' killers had arrived and left by it, sure of sanctuary beyond. It was a hard border for RUC men from Cavan or Monaghan or Donegal who couldn't go back to the home place to shoulder the coffin of a father or comfort a mother. So yes, it was a hard border right enough. Thank you very much. That's it. Everyone, I hope you like harp. Can you all hear me? Thanks again to our techs as well, who do such a wonderful job on these, these nights. The tech theories are always uh, wonderful. So we're just going to have a quick panel discussion. While we have these wonderful uh, writers with us, we might as well take advantage of it. And um, as you've heard, this is a very moving and emotive topic. And it's only right and proper in this place that we have these public conversations. So I uh, just to uh, to our three speakers. Um, I suppose the first thing is it's a hundred years now since the partition of Ireland, and I wonder what you think have been the main effects of partition, um, north and south. Mary, what do you think? We'd ask Marion for any for any of the hard questions. <laughs> we no, we though. didn't know because we left the surprise feature in. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, I mean, I think it's very hard for us to go back 100 years and experience what life was like then. But I know that um, I know that my father would say that the utter poverty, the abject poverty that he experienced in his childhood um, had, had ended. Um, you know, he grew up with no shoes, um, you know, short trousers in the winter. The, the, he, on his first job with the Gondley's milk float, he was taken out of school at age 11, according to himself. So he had a job at 11. He was one of De Valera's boys. And they would bring um, churns of milk to um, Holborn Hill, just at the back there, on in, you know, every morning. And they were called Dev's boys, De Valera's boys, because it was a free milk scheme. But he said he used to, on the frosty mornings, his legs, the, literally the skin of his legs would stick to the, the frosted uh, cart. So there's something that level of poverty you would, that we don't know. And also, if they, if they found an old boot in the field, himself and his siblings, they'd kill each other to, to get one boot to wear. So that kind of stuff, is to, you know, is gone. Yes, there's housing crisis. Yes, we have in Countess Markovitz's report in of, you know, the beginning of the state. The state of Dublin was terrible. Where are we 100 years on? The housing crisis is diabolical. It's a shame on our country. Um, after that, yes, there's poverty, not the, ex not the extreme type, but still lack of opportunity for, for young people. Um, I'd say we have moved forward somewhat, but we have a lot more to go. Mm. Well, the, the Fianna Fáil slogan used to be a lot done and no one caught. My mother no. used to end it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like I'm anti Fianna Fáil here, but I'm, I'm not, I was just having a joke with my father, really. He was here, you know, mm. delighted. <laughs> Marion, what do you think? Yeah, well, that's a tricky question, Keith. Um, I don't know. I suppose for me, I think it's more about where we are in terms of being able to talk about things like, you know, the Civil War, the War of Independence, and that, you know, 100 years ago, when people were in the thick of it, you know, they were talking about it from a very detached, maybe political way, and the trauma was very buried. Um, and I think that that's the projects like this decade of centenary projects are allowing space for people to talk about that. And, you know, in our own work where we were interviewing, you know, uh, relatives of people associated with the Noble Six and uh, with the men who were hid in Tormor Cave um, during the Civil War, you know, what's really coming out is is that kind of personal trauma, the legacy of that that's been passed down and how people nowadays can get in touch with that, even if they never knew the relative in question. Um, so I think in a way, yeah, that that's it's not necessarily uh, answering the question that you asked, but I think that's a really important um, change or difference. Jean, what about you, the view from the north? The view from the north, uh, a heck of a lot of trauma. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, actually, during the 60s in Northern Ireland, there were actually incredible strides forward and building motorways and airport factories, housing estates, and then everything just went extremely badly wrong in the late 1960s. And um, I don't think the country has, uh, the politicians haven't served it well. I can't really speak for the politicians here, but certainly in the north, um, there has been a deficit for one reason or another. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I haven't really been down here as much as it should have been, but even coming down, you always think, Jesus, how the roads got so good? Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, again, my childhood memory, I mean, Dad worked at Killeen, he worked at Fallon, he worked at Colleville, and, um, you know, it was such a difference from one side of the border to the other. Where he worked at, at Colleville uh, in the mid-1960s, we lived in Cross McGlenn for a year and a half, and... Lots of the senior policemen used to come down and fish in the River Fane, which was just at the border there at Colville. Just a, a different time, and Big Tom was over the border. And uh, yeah, um, 
things could could be a lot better, I think, in the north than than they are. So. Which I, I suppose leads to the next question. So partition has lasted a hundred years. Will it last another hundred years? Um, I'm certainly not in the position to, <laughs> to, to say, but I think it might last longer than some people expect, both the north and south. I'm not sure that all of the, nobody has come up really with a plan. And uh, I mean, there's an awful lot of planning and intricacies and the expectations of people in the north wanting to have everything that they have at the minute will be yeah. quite overwhelming. Yeah. Marion, what do you think? Tough question, I know. But it's it's very loaded question as well. <laughs> if you're you're really pulling them out today, and um, I'm probably a bit more optimistic. I don't think it's it's an immediate thing, but I don't think it's you know another century away either. Um, and I think it is uh, you know there's a greater amount of dialogue and and you know efforts at mu genuine mutual understanding and and conversation and and accepting you know, people of, of different backgrounds who just have completely opposed views and trying to work with that. Uh, so I, I think it is in sight, hopefully, yeah. I, I okay, I, I, have, I have a different view, really. Um, I would love to see Northern Ireland um, establish itself as an independent country, actually. Um, and then, as an independent country, could decide what they wanted to do, because it has very much its own identity after 100 years. Um, the systems are very different. The UK system is utterly different to ours. Our school year, our everything is completely different. Our health system, <laughs> and I know that definitely Northern Ireland has been struggling as well post-Brexit, but also, you know, the current No Stormont being operational. So all those things are very challenging. Um, and I don't think it's an easy, you know, partition or not partition. I, I don't think that's an easy, I don't think that's the right question. I think what will help our both, all communities thrive, you know. I think the sort of the nationalism or the identity is kind of overplayed in the wrong way. And I think politicians, you're right, I think politicians haven't served us, haven't led, haven't led any peace process. What they have led is more division. And that's here as well. Hmm? So they're looking over their shoulder yes. all the time. Yes. Not so, uh, yeah. Hmm. Hang on, could, 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 we, could we wait? We're, 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 no, no hang, on, hang on one second. You will get a chance to speak. We're going to have a Q&A where we're not finished having our conversation yet. So, um, one of the key themes that's emerged in this book, because it was, you know, loosely commissioned, there's just a very broad theme. And whenever you do that, you always get a kind of synchronicity. Certain themes come to the surface. It's probably capturing a zeitgeist or something. A couple of things emerged. One was the uh, importance of recovering women from the history of the two, the two states. The other one is, we've touched on already, the idea of trauma, um, that people are still haunted by the events of 100 years ago let alone recent history. Um, Fergal King wrote about this in Wounds. Um, he said there are parts of history that only the poets can convey, the deeper emotional scars that form themselves into ways of seeing things that inhabit later generations. So, I mean, what is the value of poetry? You know, Auden in his, in his elegy to Yeats says, poetry makes nothing happen. Is there value to this? Uh. Gosh, um, well, I mean, for for a long time during the Troubles, there was, you know, uh, people were afraid to kind of commit and write for, you know, just would approach things very tangentially. Um, it was thought somehow distasteful to write about the conflict. But uh, I think now possibly there's more as I say, people wanting to kind of um, say their piece, and there definitely is a role in poetry for allowing people to approach um, 
hard things from a just a slightly different angle. Um, and you know, it's too it's too early for Trouble's poetry to be judged yeah. the way the poetry of the Great War was or anything. But um, uh, I felt compelled to write some things. I mean, I wrote a poem in response to Michael Longley's ceasefire, which came out at the time of the ceasefire, and. A lot of people found that sort of difficult thing that it was because the IRA had decided it was all over, that it was all over. Um, and so I felt compelled to write something in yeah. reaction to that. Uh, and so it goes. I mean, people will still, I think, probably keep writing. I remember Longley's poem. It came out of published in the Free yeah, Irish Times. Yeah, yeah. And reworking of um, Homer. Yeah. I go down on my knees yeah. and do what must be done. Yeah. I kiss. Yeah. So it was like yeah, we're all kind of anxious now. It's all over. And sort yeah. of felt it's not. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could read the poem. I I could read that poem if you want. The poem that I wrote. That, yeah. Why not? Uh, if you don't mind. It's not very long. So for those of you who don't know, Michael Longley wrote a poem called Ceasefire in 1996. It was published on the front page of the Irish Times. But it's a reworking of the scene in the Iliad. And uh, at the end of it, very pointedly, the old king, Priam, goes down and he says, I'm trying to remember, I get down upon my knees and do what must be done and kiss Achilles' hand, the killer of my son. Out to Tander, Ceasefire, 1994. All along the motorway, they're resurfacing and bridge strengthening and seeding the central reservation with wild flowers. But only an hour or so ahead, there is fierce growth in the ditches and the road diminishes to unmendable potholes. And there are places where the light suddenly drops, where the branches out of reach of the hedge cutter are irrevocably pleached. The whole talk these days is about words the glitzy, newly honed nouns like peace and process and permanence. But there are other things to be said with reference to particular definitions and in deference to the vernacular. There are town lands where parameters invariably decline to perimeters, where you can't be middle of the road when you're the whole road. Here come the cowboy landscapers with their quick fix Castle well and goals. As an old Fermanagh woman would have said, the same boys can do feats and shite wonders. Thank you. <laughs> what, what do you think, Marion? Poetry makes nothing happen, or it does? I think the important thing is um, expressing it, and whether that's in a poem, a, short, a fictional short story, an academic work, I think that's the really important thing. And, and when there is a desire or an eagerness uh, or people want to have their story told or their family story told, it doesn't really matter what medium that's in. Some people will go for the academic book, some will go for the poem, but it's all there, you know. Um, I was speaking to somebody recently who had worked some of his grandparents' experiences of the War of Independence into a, a play. Um, so anybody going to see the play isn't going to know that he's got all of those layers of, of his own family history. And, and he said something nice that it was about preserving that, you know, that he knows that that kind of personal story is preserved in that. Um, yeah. Mary. Well, I suppose I'd have to say poetry is, you know, as of some value uh, as a poet. Um, but I think it lies very nicely along private you know, journals, diaries, letters. That's where I think the poetry sits. It, it's deeply personal. It's not meant to be polemical or political at its best. It's meant to maybe open, ask questions rather than answer them. That sounds like a good segue for a Q&A. <laughs>
Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, questions, not statements. Yes. Congratulations. I don't need one, thank you. Uh, my, my question really is for Jean. Yes. Now, as you may infer my voice, I am not supportive. Yes. The good men and principally the marchers that day, the known troublemakers were actually taken away or, you know, looked after by their own kind of kept separate. And uh, there were some of the civil rights people in Newry were wonderful people, and they everybody knew the importance of that day, being what it was. I mean, on, on the news that time, I mean, there was genuinely a fear that there was going to be an invasion. You know, there, there, there was. Uh, Lynch at the time was, there, there was concern that troops may have to be moved north to, to protect Catholics. So, and our house was under threat as well because my father was a customs man in the uniform. And we did have to leave Newry in 1973 as a result of that. No, the outsiders, it was just this. As I say, we lived on a hill and they were just streaming down the hill. You could see them gathering up. And it was all these kind of sophisticates, southern sophisticates at the time. Uh, academics who were, you know, bearded and um, Vanessa Redgrave was there. And they were strangers. Uh, I don't regard Southerners as strangers now, although I think probably from a Northern Unionist point of view, there is probably more of a gulf now than there was maybe even before the decade of centenaries, if I'm perfectly honest, hmm. uh, just the way things have moved politically. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if you're was there another point in that? that yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ray. Well, it was just, as I said, I felt, well, those guys are writing about it. I was behind the window. And it's actually strange how many of the poems that I... Uh -huh. Yeah, well, uh, how... how how, how can I say it as an invasion? <laughs> you know, it's my arm. <laughs> okay, any, any more questions? Hi. No, hang on, someone has the mic, and then you Sorry. can get your turn. Yeah. Thank you so someone um, has the mic. Hi. Um, you said uh, that with um, Susan McKay, it was a very complex book to edit. I was wondering because um, this is such a complex and um, painful history and there are so many different writers working with different forms and then you had to bring them down in sections. Did any of the writers at any point meet to talk about each other's work or was the editing, did you receive each piece separately and, and it was something completely yeah. separate? So I didn't do the commissioning, so it was... Susan had done that, so I have the editing. And I suppose the most pleasurable part of the project is trying to figure out how it's going to flow as a narrative. And um, it kind of stems from the title. So for Little Keane's interview, we had the title, and then it kind of made sense because it was here, and it inaugurated the project 
that Fergal's interview would start the piece. And he covered a lot of ground. Fergal had just come back from the war in Ukraine, had just broken out. So it opened it up into things around current problems, current borders. And then it was very easy after that. It all kind of went into place because he talked about the importance of empathy, compassion, of lived experience. Uh, so, if the, so Alice Lyons appears next because she's writing about different forms of borders, including standing on the border between Poland and Ukraine. So from then on, it was just very easy to find the flow. And what I like most of all is there's no borders between the, the genres and forms, and there's no bo borders between the first-time writers and the established writers. And I challenge you to figure out who is who. <laughs> so that, that was very pleasurable for me, and I, I hope we did justice to the contributions. Thank you. Thank you. So, sir. You no, it's OK. Do you want your question or not, sir? No, I don't. OK, fine. So the word empathy has come up a lot, um, either talking about, you know, the, the interview with Fergal, um, but also it seems like all of you had a sort of uh, an adventure in empathy. And I just wanted to ask you how these beautiful bits of work you've done, or, you know, how that's made you feel about the people that you've written about, you know, yourself, your family, uh, strangers in a cave. Mm -hmm. I found it uh, very interesting because as an archaeologist, the people I research, you know, have been dead for thousands of years. <laughs> you don't even know what language they spoke. You don't know their names. Um, and the last two years have been completely transformative in terms of, you know, I'm now researching people who have relatives. Some of those relatives look like the men and women that I'm looking at. And I think that's the thing, that this enormous empathy. You know, I know Mary's family, her ancestry. I don't know anything. More than I do. <laughs> it's probably a bit true. <laughs> uh, it is true. Um, and yeah, and I think in a way that I'm somebody who wanted to do history in secondary school and just found it really boring. <laughs> Did it at university, found it boring. And that was because it was all about politics and big individuals. It wasn't actually about people. And all of the, the stories and the work I've been doing the last two years, it's all about people. All these incredible women, you mentioned women in Sligo who were trekking up and down mountains with food, leaving Sligo town on a Wednesday and on a Sunday, going out to Rathcormac with, you know, and, and the amount of hardship that they put themselves through um, and the men as well. And, you know, in a way, our work excavating that cave, that was the big thing for the three of us, the, the empathy and really getting a sense of how horrific the conditions would have been for 30 men in, for six weeks in this very cold, wet, damp place. Um, and that's what I think is, is really important about all the different works, whether it's a, an archeological excavation or writing a poem. It's the way that these things are done now, and, and you're getting a real, very tangible sense of, you know, the real person who was doing this and making those decisions, often at a quite young age, you know, 22, 23, 24 year old men and women, and how it affected them for the rest of their lives. A lot of them died quite young. They had, you know, uh, lung problems. Um, psychological scars. So yeah I, yeah, I find a huge empathy for those people that I don't often have in my archaeological work. Empathy might be a good place to uh, pause here. Um, th this project marks the end of the decade of centenaries in Sligo. So just to kind of begin wrapping things up, I want to call on uh, Donald Tinney, the county librarian, but also was a decade of centenaries coordinator to say a few words. Donald. Coherlock, uh, Councillor Jared Milani, and Mayor of Sligo, Councillor Declan Bree, County Councillors. Chief Executive Martin Lydon, Director of Service Dorothy Clark, and distinguished guests. Talukhar Moor Arun Mavahamshah Anakht, the 
I'm delighted to be here tonight for many reasons, to be here on the last night, at the last event of the Decade of Centenary. First and foremost, it was a pleasure and an honour to be asked to be coordinator for Sligo. What a rich history. Every aspect, every year of the decade, there was something that Sligo had contributed to the 10 years of history, most important history period in the early 20th century, from the lockout strike in Sligo, which led to a six month dispute, I think, which was, or sorry, six months before the Dublin lockout strike. And Jim Larkin and James Connell learned a lot from the strike here, apparently, and applied it in the Dublin lockout strike to the World War I and the participants from here from Sligo as well. And on and on it went. Um, it was really an honour and a pleasure. From the outset, of course, we were given a brief. It is a controversial decade. And there was an expert group of historians set up, which included Morris Manning, Mark Manser, people of that ilk, very, very well versed in history. And we were tasked with delivering, where possible, as much of the untold stories as well celebrating those people who contributed to that history, who maybe for one reason or another were airbrushed out of history. We're thinking of women in particular and their role. And also the World War I was nearly something that unmentionable in some quarters for decades. So we were at a task with approaching it all in a respectful manner, in a balanced manner, and trying to arrange as many events and projects and program as much as we could to commemorate in a fitting way. And also our brief included the communities. Each one of the coordinators in each county had to include the community and the communities. And that meant a two-way process that we were to list off the events, list off how we would approach celebrating and commemorating the events, but also a listening ear to the communities that were out there, as to how they were going to do theirs and assist them. As I say, um, we would give, through our working group, the Decade Centenary Grant Aid, or we would program with communities, or with the relatives, and it was a particular honour to work with relatives of those who took part and contributed to this Decade of Centenary. And we had many moving occasions where people eventually got to have their say about what their relatives did, or eventually be allowed to commemorate. Thinking of one in particular, the Connacht Rangers Mutiny, where they were promised to be recognised in the 70s, but was at the height of the troubles, and was felt to be too sensitive. So the men passed away without having that commemorated. But we addressed that with the Uktra on the Hair and Michael D. Higgins coming and launching a memorial, or launching an event and unveiling a memorial down in Tubbercurry. Anyway, our, our community brief also included the diaspora. There are Sligonians all over the world, like every other county, or everywhere. And from the get-go, we decided that we would include our diaspora. So we decided to live stream any major event. And tonight is partly a legacy of that streaming. And we've continued to do that. It was particularly warden to have our Easter 1916 commemorative event trending on Twitter, watched in 57 countries that day. It was phenomenal. The decade of centenaries for the period 1913-23 addressed some of the more complicated periods of Irish history. And using primary sources, research, and the knowledge of our many local historians. We try to document aspects of our history, the rich history of Sligo, as I say. As I said, we were also tasked with telling the untold. And topics such as the role of women in the revolutionary period, people such as Bridget O'Malley, who organized Common and Man in so many different counties. We have to thank, of course, as well, the military archives for this research material, which was digitized and readily available. You could look up your relatives on that. And things. Linda Cairns, relative of Councillor Michael Clark, of course, Countess Markovich, were highlighted. And one of my more favorite days was the Women's Day, 
Women were granted the vote in 1918, but unlike men who could vote at 21, they could only vote at the age of 30. Different times. Different, they'd wait a decade more to get equality on that one. The commemoration of World War I and the research of Simone Hickey into the 600 plus men and women from Sligo who died in that war was invaluable. And it helped many families of those who had lost men and women in that war. We started off with one dead man's penny, which is what the widow or widower got for their partner, husband or wife if they were killed in the war in the museum here we had won. By the time we had finished our first exhibition in 1914, we had five. And by the time we did a commemoration of the Somme, we had six. It just kept coming. People kept coming. My grandfather was in the war. That was the buried history, very important history. And for various reasons that we know our history, people joined to fight in World War I. We heard it complicated. The, the, the border is and all. It's equally complicated. People were living. They were going into the army to earn a keep, to feed their families. Some people went in for idealistic purposes, to protect small countries. There's all the different, you know, all the history of that, the Redmond and working for home rule, all of those different elements. So we have to take all these on board. And we try to commemorate those. We had over 60 events in the 10 years. I started going through some of the events we had. It went on forever. I mean, it just was phenomenal, the amount of material that we unearthed and the events that we carried out in partnership with our communities. And some of the main events that I have mentioned already, but one in particular was Banner the Development, Commemorative Garden, and the work of Sean Owens down there, a dynamo of a community worker. And he has down there in a beautiful garden. And if you haven't seen it, you should go down and see it. It's a beautiful place. It commemorates the War of Independence, the Civil War. Everything is covered down there. Easter 1916. Les Sligo forgets in the wonderful memorial garden and the moving tribute to the fallen uh, when um, the Blue Raincoat, Niall Henry, and organized 600 relatives to march to the cenotaph. It's very moving, that. I mentioned the Connacht Rangers and the work of Mary and Brendan Henry in Tupperkurry but also the Civil War programme and the seeing of so many kids in the Hawkeswell, in so many sessions there, listening and partaking in the discussion and the lectures, which included not only both sides of the Civil War, but we tried to reflect those who weren't involved in the Civil War, namely the Unionist community of Sligo, of which there was a considerable number. How were they thinking, sitting in their rooms, as we said earlier, looking out the window? You know? Um, I would like to thank the many individuals, communities, and groups who have provided support and encouragement along the way. As I say, it was a privilege to work with relatives of those who had contributed. I'd like to reference the Cross Party Decadent of Centenary Working Group, made up of county councillors who provided support and advice on our programme and liaise with communities on our behalf as well. Members over the decade included Cahirla Councillor Gerard Mullaney, Mayor Councillor Bree, Councillor Grady, Clark, McManus, both Sean and uh, Chris, and um, replaced them by Arthur Gibbons, Councillor Thomas Healy, Gino Boyle, ba Martin Baker, Tom McSharry, Marie Cassidy, Sinead McGuire, Donald Gilroy, Paul Taylor, and Councillor Walsh. I wish to thank two chief executives, Keon Hayes and Martin Lydon, who's here tonight, and Director of Service, Dorothy Clark, for their support throughout the decade. It was absolutely brilliant to have that facility to go and do the work and to be known that the support was on your, at your back. Like guys, we had tremendous support from local historians, Michael Farry, Porrick Diagnan, Marion Dowd, Joe McGowan, Keen Hart, Simone Hickey, and our own librarians, Pat Gannon and Michelle Cashman. I'd like to also extend a big thank you to our writer in residence, Susan McKay, who can't be here tonight, unfortunately. But it was really an interesting discussion I had when Susan first came to work. 
I too grew up on the border. We lived in the Midlands, but we were shipped up to our granny's farm, which was literally a kilometre from a cratered road. And when she sent you to the shop, you went to what was her old school, a corrugated building, which she went to school in when Queen Victoria was still alive. But what we were doing going up to the shop there was actually smuggling. It was a kilometre to that shop, or it was five kilometres to the town. Work it out yourself. I was only 12. I wasn't going to go the extra mile. And this is where borders are a strange thing. And if you live on a border, you can get this very quickly. And Sligo is a border county. It's not that long ago since you could get a ship from here to Glasgow or get the train from here to Belfast. And when I first went to college in Dublin as a Donegal person, it was very difficult for Dubliners to understand that I thought maybe Belfast first before I thought of, Donneg of Dublin. But anyway, and I, just one other benefit of the border, I just, when I was board school, I was beside two twins from London in the dormitory. Bluets were their name. And across the way was a Gilmartin lad whose family had moved back from Leeds to buy a hotel here in the Northwest. And what I could get, which wasn't available here in the Free State, South Republic, was opal mints, opal fruits, wagon wheels. And I was able to get the grandest of chicken sandwiches from the hotel in exchange. It was a form of barter. So, yes, borders. Don't talk to me about borders. Uh, I'd, like to also, uh, I'd like to also thank the support of uh, the Department of Tourism, Arts, Gaelic Sports and Media, one of the longest titles, of course, in particular Neil Caron and Kate Nevin, who worked up there tirelessly and supported us. There's a whole support team behind all of this. And what can I say about our library team? They were just excellent, excellent. The skill set in the library at the minute is phenomenal. I'm in the libraries over 40 years. What we are doing now in libraries, if you told me 20 years ago we'd be doing this, I wouldn't have believed you. Nothing was beyond them. From setting up meetings, places and lecterns with chairs, and whatever, to library staff designing posters, memorabilia for the 2016 collector's item from buttons to banners, which people saw from all over the place, and even going to the next extent, and that's learning about online, filming for YouTube channels, live streaming, all that to provide a wider audience and access to what we were doing, and particularly effective in COVID-19. Yes, I did mention it. So thank you in the early years to Pauline Brennan, who is now the county librarian in Leitrim, and to Patricia Keane, senior executive librarian, who did Trojan work with Susan and Keith in delivering this book tonight. Fantastic work behind the scenes, along with many, many other areas of the decades. Indeed, Patricia is a stalwart. She's brilliant. To the executive librarians, Ulton McNasser, Pat Gannon, and Michelle Brennan, a big thank you for the events you organized and brought to fruition. Thank you to Jen, who was a creative star with her graphic designs. You'd mentioned to Jen, I want a banner with Nafina flag on it, and this, that, and the other stars, uh, Plowy Star, etc. She came up with that banner. Absolutely wonderful. What you saw when you came into the county, and you see currently, welcome to Yates Country. Jen designed that, working with Pat. Thank you to Jen, as I say, and to the administrators behind it all to manage the budgets and returns to the department, Anna Connellan, Michelle Dunleavy, and Nula Fowley. A big thank you. And of course, the County Council staff finance section, because it's not easy dealing with this type of non-usual, uh, unusual, I should say, um, programming from a council's perspective. It's, 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 we have our procurements and all that type of thing. The, su the success of our streamed events is down to the excellent support of two local companies. Initially, we used Ava, they were excellent, and Studio Rovan James and his team here tonight with streaming. They do a fantastic job. And of course, in doing these online things, we're ticking another box. The recordings of lectures and major events, along with tonight's publications, will also fulfill another brief, and that is to provide a legacy for future generations of Sligo. 
When we started this, we started looking back, particularly for the 1916, at what happened in 1966 and things like that. So we hope that future generations will still have an interest and will look back, maybe from 50 years on or whatever. So Mila Bukas, thank you for to the participating communities, relatives and contributors to the programme. The audience here tonight, previous audiences and audiences online. Thank you very much. I have to introduce now Ramon is going to give us one final piece of music. And again, thank you very much. And well done. It was a fantastic discussion. I really enjoyed it. Well done. Happy tune by Irish harpist and composer Torlok O'Carroll. O'Carroll Concerto.